you can hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. So in Spanish, water law, which comes from Roman water law, um, <coughs> big rivers were to be public, basically. Uh, small irrigation, however, was managed in common property uh, style that I will speak about in a moment, uh, talking about Ostrom, yeah? But they didn't, oh, no, no. I mean, this is, this is in the fifth, 15th century, that kind of thing, so they didn't have hydropower dams. And they don't, they hardly have any rivers left in Spain. I don't know if you've traveled in the south of Spain. You keep on driving over bridges, and you think, ah, oh, you know, nice bridge. But why is it here? Like, you know, there's, um, I don't know, rivers are gone. And this, you know, along the south of Spain, to, to a very large extent, a frightening extent. Um, yeah, so prior appropriation, the right to the first person to take the, a river uh, and use it productively, it's a little bit related to, um, oh, there's a radical leftist uh, uh, version of this, which is that uh, the farmers should have the right to the land they work on, which, I, which is what that Spanish text there says, uh, that, that the, the land to the tiller, I think, in English, um, instead of these absent land owners who might be living in, you know, in London or Paris or Delhi or wherever, um, that the land should sort of be given to the people who work on it. Um, Binswanger has shown that that is one of the major reasons, or was, I mean, this is a work that a few decades ago, uh, one of the major reasons for the, destruct, for the cutting down of the Amazon was <coughs> that people were creating property rights. You cut down, I mean, the, the Amazon will belong to nobody, you cut down some, uh, a bunch of trees, you put out fences, uh, modern looking, or some kind of house, and you throw in some cattle, and you could claim that you had developed this place. You were an agent of progress and, you know, building the future of Brazil. And, uh, you know, and you'd be given deeds. And um, I met someone in Costa Rica uh, once. My f the first trip to Costa Rica was roughly when I was making these slides. And, um, and you know, just in a, in a cafe, a regular guy, a conversation, and he says that he told me he has this beautiful forest, that he loves it so much, and now he has to cut it down. And I say, why are you going to cut it down? Well, if I don't cut it down, someone else might cut it, come and cut it down, and then it would become theirs. <laughs> that guy would lose, not only the beauty would be gone either way, but I would lose the land. Um, and the most drastic example of this is squatting. Do you know what squatting is? Is it like a I looked it up on the internet and it's, it's two things, so I warn you. There is one, one sense of the word squat that is less appropriate, but um, related to gymnastics and body features. But otherwise the word squat means to occupy uh, other people's property. Mm -hmm. right? And um, here's a, a guy, Hampstead Heath is a very attractive place in the centre of London. <laughs> it's always hard to turn those off, when <laughs> but you can throw it out the window or something. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is a big a newspaper in England. And a squatter here was given a piece of property worth two million pounds. That's 25 million kroner. This is a nice property right in the middle, just slightly north middle of London, Hampstead Heath. Very nice place. And he'd been, he'd been living in a shack. This is a poor guy who um, had never had any trade or profession, according to what he'd told the judge. Uh, so he'd been living in this homemade shack, 
in the corner of this property. Just a strange, some strange guy, right? Um, but he'd been living there for 12 years, and um, he won a court case and was given property rights to the whole property. <laughs> the whole property? <laughs> yeah, the whole property, not just his shack. The whole property. So two million dollar pounds of, uh, he was given a, a plot of land worth two million dollars for nothing, for just for living there. Right? And this, I find this, this, and on one occasion, I, maybe it was two years ago or four years ago, I was giving this course, and I asked, does anyone know anything about squatting? And they were like, two or three people. Yeah, I live in a squat. <laughs> and one particularly from Barcelona. And, you know, according to him, everybody lived in a squat in Barcelona, which I suppose means all his friends. Not literally everybody, but... Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, I think, fairly common. In, and there is, for instance, you can find the squatter's handbook on the, it, it was originally just a book you could buy, now you can get it on the internet, you see a guy is, is climbing into a property. And particularly in England, the law is very clear, you don't have the right, I read this in the squatter's handbook, <laughs> you don't have the right to break into a property. But you could, for instance, go past one day and kind of destroy the lock and break a few windows, and then you could come along the next day, or a few hours later, or something, you'd find the property basically unlocked. Oh, there's a, you know, and then you can move in. And you have the right to move in, and the police does not have the right to throw you out. Unless? No, no there's no unless, actually. Uh, so if you leave the property, they do have the right <laughs> to stop you from going in again. I mean, they, they have, you know, they could, the police or the former owner, the, the, the on paper owner, has the right to then put in new locks and you know, himself move back in. Um, but if you have 20 friends, if you <laughs> then you uh, can arrange, so there's always some people left in the house, and you basically gain access to the house, you can live there for a number of years. This was what, what my student from Barcelona was doing. Um, it is robbery, I think, but, I mean, well, is it robbery? <laughs> Do we have any? <laughs> then it's robbery, and you, and suppose it's a, a very rich and unpleasant guy who moved to New York and hasn't been there for five years anyway, and you know, and then someone who's homeless, and then. Take care of it, That's use it productively. Everyone. This is like the people who, who, who cut down the trees and clean up the jungle and put in nice cows and fences. And uh, yeah, they are making the place better. They're, um, you know, they paint the buildings and repair the stairways. And, so, and they are making productive. This is progress. I mean, this, is, this is a strong feeling that humanity seems to have, that building things and putting things in order and putting up cement and structures is progress. So if you sort of do progressive things like that, you sort of gain some rights. Typically, typically they are, there is no one living in, in the building. Uh, in the building, you know, there could be a rich guy and I, he has many houses and uh, he dies and his children don't care and whatever. And they, they, so it's standing there year after year, you know, and it's not being used. At the same time, you have uh, people who for various reasons, maybe good reasons, maybe not so good reasons, don't have money and don't have a job and don't have, don't have anywhere to live and still they have children and, and whatever and they need to get out of the rain and so they move in. And of course the people who do this will always make up a fairly good story. They will always say that they've been discriminated in the workplace because they are Jews, they are Arabs, they are something else, they lost their job, they, they need to feed their children, <laughs> whatever. They, you know, so. History will judge, uh, you know, it's, it's, sometimes the arguments are good, sometimes they're not so good. Sometimes, sometimes the, 
the owner was a real asshole and uh, probably made all the, his money through corruption anyway and is like far away. And sometimes this is a, a regular guy who just happens to be away for a few months and then the house is broken into. And so our sympathies can vary a little bit from case to case. This guy, I, I was searching on the, on the internet today, so I don't know the, uh, I don't know how reliable this guy is, but he's a journalist. He says that there are about a billion people who are squatters mm -hmm. in the world. Um, where else? <laughs> um, no, I don't know if that number is really reliable, but it shows that it maybe is not a, a, a very marginal phenomenon. It's quite a big uh, thing, and 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 I think a lot of people in poor in the big cities of the third world, they um, they move from the countryside in to and they occupy land on the outskirts of cities in pretty difficult areas sometimes and they um, they themselves have to steal the power and build the roads and or whatever and gradually they organize and they persuade the, the local government to to put in some sewers and and eventually to give them property rights and eventually they get property rights and they become middle-class homeowners. And then they try and do the <laughs> Yeah, this is a process. Property rights are created. Right? Um, uh, there is something called enclosure. I think I have a nice picture here. This is enclosure. If you, if you drive, I grew up in England, so I, um, you drive through the countryside in England, what do you see? You don't see anything because there are hedges on each side of the road. This is a bit of an exaggerated picture, but this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, you see, have quite big hedges on each side of the road, very often in the British countryside. And all these hedges, they were original fences. That's the way uh, you built, you showed property rights is by planting a hedge around your land. And that was called enclosing the land. And that's where the word enclosure comes from. So, in, so the, the commons were basically open land. And when they were taken by someone and made private, they put a hedge around and then they started, you know, treating it as private land. And I have uh, this painful memory of schools, of history lessons, I thought were boring at, in school. And they were always, there were a number of things they were talking about. And enclosure of the commons was one that was very common uh, you know, theme. And I didn't think it was interesting at the time. Now I think this is fascinating. You know, I wish I had listened a bit more. But already back in 1235, there was um, a, a statute, the statute of Merton. This is 20 years after the Magna Carta, which was the first one, the first sort of big legal document in England, which limited the power of the king. And required the king, for instance, the king did not have the right to hold, uh, and torture and kill, uh, prisoners, uh, but had to kind of give, there was some kind of protection and it's interesting that that, that, uh, that those rights were, were really uh, damaged by um, Guantanamo and, and others in the last decade and the war on terrorism because so many people taken prisoners and just arbitrarily sh locked up somewhere with, for many years. <coughs> but this, this statute of Merton allowed the lords to start enclosing common land. So they got the right to take land that was common to a village uh, and, um, uh, and there were revisions uh, 
various times through history. And in fact, these laws were only repealed in 1948. There's a guy called Sir Thomas More. He's in fact a saint in the Catholic Church, Saint Thomas More. He fought the, uh, for Catholicism and against Henry VIII. Um, and he wrote a book called Utopia, which is completely dedicated to sort of fighting the idea of enclosure. He calls enclosure theft. He's, and he says that the increase of pasture is, um, and, and, and the spread of rich people's sheep to make uh, wool and, and meat was a way of um, uh, bereaving villages, towns, and ordinary common people of the land where they would be growing their potatoes and whatever they were growing. So it was a way of killing people, basically. He calls this theft and murder, and he's, he's very, uh, and he used the word enclosure. So this is a, uh, and the king was worried. So there's this structure with the king here, the lords, and then the smaller lords and then the people. And the lords were stealing the land. The king, who was the finest of all the lords, he was worried about this. Because the more stuff, the more land that the lords took, the more um, poor people were created. And these poor people, they were thrown out from their homes. They would start wandering around the uh, countryside uh, as vagabonds. And, and, and they had to be kind of be imprisoned and dealt with. And they became a problem. The king was worried there'd be too many of these around. <coughs> And so there were anti-enclosure laws throughout history, trying to stop the lords from, from, from stealing the common land. So, uh, this is a, a big part of history. And some people uh, think, particularly radical ecologists, uh, think that this is happening today in many areas. And that business, capitalism, whatever, uh, is privatizing all kinds of things. Genetic information, radio wave frequencies, uh, outer space. You can buy land, you can buy plots on the moon today. I mean, there's a company, and, you know, you find it online and you pay the money and they, they will write your deed to a plot on the moon. I don't know really what you could do with it, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway. Um, you look up Monsanto, and rights, I just googled that before. So in, in the version of these slides that I sent out, it said two million hits. That was four years ago. Today it was 23 million hits. Um, because Monsanto, basically, they, um, they are taking uh, patents on various genetics on seeds. So a farmer, uh, Basically, when you buy these seeds from Monsanto, you have to sort of sign a document which is like 300 pages long and tiny print. And of course the farmers don't read this. But they sign that they don't have the right to take their seeds and then sow them next year. So you have to buy new seeds every year because Monsanto owns the genetic code. And um, we had a neighbor in, when we lived in Washington who was a lawyer and he was fighting a case with Monsanto. So he told me about this. And uh, so I said to him, um, that's crazy, you know, because that's the foundation of civilization. If anything is a natural right, it is the right of a farmer to take his harvest and to sow it. That's the foundation of human civilization. And then the next day my, my neighbor got to his job and BBC was standing there and they kind of, they wanted to interview him and he was, you know, he said, oh, yesterday I spoke to a farmer, uh, a Swedish farmer, and he said that we have always taken the seeds that we have harvested. <laughs> so, so I got quoted on uh, BBC as a Swedish farmer. This is, this is if, you want, if you like radical uh, ecologism, there's a journal called The Ecologist, uh, and they, they very often write about enclosure. They hate enclosure. So I must say, I have mixed feelings about this, because um, 
I don't like open access. I know that open access destroys resources. Um, and I think that sometimes, you know, uh, the radical ecologists maybe go a little far in, in, in when they hate all kinds of enclosure. Sometimes, I think, that, for instance, the, the privatization of the world's oceans, the law of the seas, I think was great. I think we would have, you know, there wouldn't be any fishes left if we hadn't, if we hadn't given the nations the, the right to, to the sea. So, you know, so I, on the other hand, it's true. I do feel uneasy about Monsanto owning life. Or, or genetic. Now, I'm just going to talk about a slightly parallel line of um, uh, line of articles. Uh, some articles and some legal cases cited by Coase. Coase is an important thinker on property rights, and um, there is. Um, Suppose you have a yeah. You could imagine these being two properties. This this is a hill down to the river, and you have a house here. Let's say a summer house, you know, and you. Uh, your kids play in the garden, and there's a lovely sort of view of the river. It's a little paradise. And then uh, a farmer buys this piece of land here and puts up his giant barn with 1,000 pigs, and uh, there's a horrible sort of smell. So then uh, the value of your summer paradise is kind of heavily diminished. In fact, it's hard to sell the house. It, you know, it, it, uh, it's, and, and um, um, there's a conflict of interest. There's an externality, you might say, here. Right? The production of, of um, it's okay if you have one pig, but if you like running around in the field, but if you have a thousand pigs in a building, it, it does make a horrible stench. Right? So, so there is an externality to the people who live around. And um, you can sympathize. You can, there, are, there have been thousands of cases in, in, in the legal history where people have complained, uh, for instance, over neighbors uh, um, being a nuisance. Nuisance is the legal term here. Right? Um, destroying their... And you could imagine sympathizing with either party, I think. You know, if you might sympathize with this, family because this is a well you know a horrible sort of big industry polluting the river and making a mess but you could also imagine maybe the the rich tourist being a little bit too sensitive and coming out to the countryside and then not liking uh, the smell of even of one pig and like and then complaining about well why do we have to have pigs in the countryside and well uh, you know he's happy to buy ham for dinner but he doesn't want to <laughs> have the smell of a pig around his summer house. So you could imagine your sympathies going with either or, depending on a number of factors, like who was there first, who is doing the greatest social good, um, and many other factors. And there's a number of interesting cases here throughout history. And there is a, a principle here with an Latin name that all lawyers will know what this means uh, basically says that you must manage your property in such a way as not to damage that damage that of, of others um, so that's sort of you know a externality kind of uh, Plutus pay principle kind of uh, in, in early in early Latin um, but there's also and coasts traces a number of cases close to New York and um, shows that originally there were uh, the courts would, would support uh, the, the people being disturbed but eventually they started um, supporting more um, the developers and saying well for, we can't build a city like New York if you don't, if you don't allow people to use dynamite 
So <laughs> when we want a city, people, developers must use dynamite. And yes, a few rocks might flow into, fly into the neighboring property, but uh, you know, as long as the builders use reasonable care, they have the right to, you know, to use dynamite, and otherwise we wouldn't have any progress. So, so Coase analyzes all these cases, and you can read all the details in chapter 3 and chapter 8. But this gives us an opportunity to to remind ourselves what an externality is, right? An externality in a utility function or, or a production function here. You've got the utility <coughs> function of individual I, and it depends on all kinds of things like how much labor I spend, how much sugar and ice cream and cheese I eat, and then suddenly my utility depends on like what you do, if you smoke, for instance, you know, and well, that's nothing I can control. So therefore, there's this part of my utility is being is being controlled by you, and then well, so that's an externality. <coughs> and there's this famous case that Coase writes a lot about. See, exactly, you have here, you have the case of this this Sturges versus Bridgman. Um, I've forgotten who's who, but let's say it was Bridgman was the confectioner. A confectioner is a guy who makes sweets. And apparently to make sweets you had to pound sugar. Sugar came in big like cones originally, and you had to pound them. And so, he, the, so th this guy, Bridgman, owned the house and he pr produced sweets and the sweet making made a noise. But he only needed half his house and then he rents out the other half to Dr. Sturge who comes along and he's a medical doctor and he needs to use a stethoscope. You know, the thing it plugs in your ears and you listen to the chest and the heart of the patient. So um, he moves in and like as soon as he's moved in he, he starts complaining about his about the, his, uh, his, uh, the house owner and says, you can't make this noise, you rented me a room, I'm a doctor, I need to listen to my patients, you've got to stop making this noise. And he says, well, that's my job, I can't, you know, I make sweets, I, can't, I have to make a noise. So, they, their case goes to court. And in this case, this guy, he is there first. He's uh, low income, <coughs> relatively speaking, although he's the house owner, but, but he still is a, a, a lower income person. Uh, this guy comes in, you know, second, and he's a, a high income earner, relatively speaking. Um, now, Coase says, well, I mean, discusses who is producing the externality. Both. Yeah, well, that's the Kosian. That's, that's what Kos says, yeah. A lot of people sort of say, well, uh, this guy is making the noise, right? Producing the externality. Well, question mark, right? Because this guy makes the noise. When he makes sweets, he makes noise. So basically, noise is part of his production function, uh, as an input into his production function. And the noise Literally, it would sort of seem the noise travels, you know, that way. But Coase says, oh no, no, I mean, that's just trivial. Uh, either you have sweet making and that produces noise, or you have, like, doctoral examination, that requires silence, and then silence has to be imposed that way, and so you could see this as a symmetrical problem. One guy impose, imposes noise on the other, the other guy imposes silence on the, on the first. So, so, well, I think I, I had a slide for this. Um, so, you, you can sort of say, well, <coughs> the confectioner has, needs to make noise in order to, you know, and then that becomes an externality for the, uh, for the, for the doctor. Or the, the doctor needs to impose silence, 
Uh, you can sort of see this as a, uh, as a symmetrical problem. And um, what Coase recommends and says is that there's nothing natural. And in fact, he, he argues against um, Pigou, I think. Pigou says in this article that uh, um, oh, is arguing about trains and saying the trains uh, d uh, produce these sparks and that creates forest fires and that it sort of is not natural. And uh, and uh, Coase says this is a mistake. Uh, that uh, either you have trains or you have undisturbed forests. But there's, neither is like one is more natural than the other, and society just has to choose. Um, and he sort of says that in this village, there may be many sweet makers, but it's unusual to have a doctor. This is sometime in, back in history. And so a doctor is more valuable. So, you know, the, the doctor is, is perhaps the more important. And, and um, yeah, I think that's an interesting perspective on this. Right, I'm going to talk a bit about Eleanor Ostrom and this book. I strongly recommend it. It's a, it's a lovely book to read. And um, she collects, I mean, she spent decades visiting so many villages. And not only, you know, like irrigation schemes, meadows, fishing villages, but also fire stations, police stations, and looking at the organization of, of collective services, basically. And um, so, for instance, she looked at a bunch of irrigation systems in Spain. And these are, if you look at the Spanish map, the, the south coast of Spain, <coughs> there's a number of these rivers, not much water left in them, as I was saying before, but they basically flow out into the Mediterranean in the towns of Valencia, Murcia, Alicante, and, and others. And there are lots of, of irrigation systems there that have been, in some cases, working for five or six hundred years. And the problem these farmers face that is basically an irrigation scheme looks like this. You got you've got sort of canals going in all these directions, and then they go out to the fields. And if it's really dry, and you're producing something here, and there's like three weeks left to harvest you would kill to get water. I mean, it, is, it, is, it makes the difference. Your whole year's uh, crop can be destroyed within a, a few weeks. And so <clears throat> there's a, a, a problem of who gets the water. And they have um, solved this in, uh, you know, there's, a, there's this is not something that the Spanish government manages. This is something that local farmers manage. And they, they elect the farmers, they elect some uh, officials. These officials uh, get some honor and respect in their society, maybe some small payment. They very often get to keep some of the fines, half the fines, for instance. So there will be system, if, if I see someone stealing water, I report that person. That's a risk for me to report him. Um, uh, if he is found guilty and fined, maybe I get half the fine and the syndic gets the other half. And there, you know, so the, there is, um, um, when there is a lack of water, the farmers take turns. A very typical arrangement is a physical system where there is a wheel here and basically uh, the water goes either this canal or this canal or this canal, and they, they take turns. And um, the, 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 the taking of water, the water in order, is um, an important aspect of this. 
there's a lot of details in this, but basically, um, if you are waiting for your turn here, uh, you get ready, uh, you prepare your fields, there's a lot of things you have to close and open a lot of gates and these canals and stuff, and you make sure, uh, basically, that the guy before you is, is hurries up and finishes and becomes your turn, and so there's, some of the monitoring problem is, is solved by this. Otherwise, there's a problem. Suppose we are all farmers, who's going to monitor you? Well, uh, by having a system where you take turns, if it's my turn after you, then I will always be monitoring you. And if you are after me, then you will be monitoring me. So we solve some of the monitoring problem. Um, they have found some fine books that are from, from, already from the 14th century. And so this allows you to sort of see, if you're going to design a system, it's, it's quite delicate how you decide, how you, how you um, decide the punishments. Suppose we were left on an island here and we kind of had to set up rules for, for you know, behavior. If you set rules that are too harsh, then the person who gets punished will feel excluded, may leave the group, may stop collaborating. So one of, one of Eleanor's um, findings was that you need to have graduated sanctions. The first time you break a rule, maybe it's by a mistake, misunderstanding. So the first time is generally a very small fine. And the second time is a bigger fine, and so on. And they have found that even the harbor, there are, there are gangs, quite violent and quite nasty, apparently, but gangs who, who manage the lobster and fishing trade in Maine. And um, the first time you, someone makes a mistake and takes lobsters out of someone else's trap or something, they just uh, write a, sort of a little warning on your, a little sort of note on your boat or something. The second time, <laughs> it gets a lot worse. <laughs> to the third time, you're probably gone. You know. So, um, yeah. this is from a fishing village uh, in Turkey, actually, where uh, um, that is described in, in great detail in this in this book. Um, there are some. <coughs> some places that are better for putting your net than others. Okay? So, how do, you, how, do you, um, how do you make sure it isn't like the strongest guy who always puts his net in the best place? Well, again, there's a sort of a system of taking turns. They make a list of all the people who are eligible. And so, you know, Eleanor said, well, you, you have to have a place where people can meet like a court, a court or a local sort of court, well, it could be a cafe. You know. And then they make a list of who, who has the right to fish, and they exclude anybody who hasn't got the right to fish. Um, they draw lots on the first day, and then the second day, they, everybody moves like one step west or something. And this, this Arrangement, again, is, is like kind of the, the kind of arrangement that, that has worked in some places for centuries. Did anybody, any of you know of this kind of like resource management scheme or seen these in villages and how they manage pastures or irrigation systems or fishing waters or anything like that? I've read, uh, it, it seems reputation is very important to people in villages. Maybe that is why village life is relatively conservative and careful. But um, if you think of this as a repeated game, we're going to, you know, to, to have a relationship with these neighbors for your whole life and for the life of your children and your grandchildren and so on, then your reputation is quite important because maybe you want to borrow something from these people. Um, you need to trust each other, and reputation is important. That's quite important when we play a prisoner's dilemma, a game. 
So we'll, we'll get back to the prisoner's dilemma. In fact, we might move to the. So there's other examples from uh, meadows in Switzerland. It seems there are records back to the 12th century. Now let's let's look at um, uh, at this kind of prisoner's dilemma game. Does anyone? Do you all know what the prisoner's dilemma game is? I'm hoping someone doesn't know, so it makes the teaching more fun. <laughs> so let me show you how you kind of write the, uh, um, a game. Right, so suppose you have two players. Okay, I'll remove some of this. You have a player A and a player B. And player A can choose between doing this and doing that. So player A chooses the column and player B chooses the row. And then you, you write the payoffs here. So for instance, let's, let's look at this, at this game here and tell me what you see here. Is that a prisoner's dilemma? No. No prisoner's dilemma, right? So what happens here? Basically, if B chooses this row, he will always get 9. If he chooses this row, he'll get 1. So what's he going to choose? Yeah, he's going to choose this row. And A, he will always get five if he chooses column one, and he'll always get three if he chooses. So there's, there's a pretty boring game, right? Okay, and uh, they're going to choose this. Uh, and you can see this is, GDP here is 14, right? And it's always uh, lower in the other cases. This is a Pareto optimum. It's a Nash optimum. It's everything. It's just, it's just, it's just the, the result of that game. It's very simple. Right? Now, um, suppose you have uh, this game. Uh, we're five, three, 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 five, nine, and three, two. Now what, what's, what's going on here? If A chooses the first column, he will get 5. If A chooses the second column, he'll get 3. But then look at B. B, if he chooses this column, he'll get 3. If he chooses this column, he might get 9, he might get 2. So what's B going to choose? Well, yeah, it depends on how intelligent he is, right? <laughs> so because B, he might think, oh, look, I might get 9 here, I might get 2. Um, you know, he doesn't know. The thing is that here there is an externality from, from A to B, but there's no externality from B to A. So if B is smart, he's going to say, oh, well, A is going to choose 5 going to choose this column, so therefore I can choose 2 because then I get 9. So it's quite easy to solve. But now we have this game over here. This is, this is a prisoner's dilemma. Eh? And um, what would you choose? Depends on the guy. <laughs> Who am I playing with, right? Yeah, well you're playing with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be selfish. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, I mean, uh, suppose you're A. Then you can choose either this, you know, well, you don't know, but suppose I'm going to choose the first row. So then you, you could either, you can choose between 2 and 0. Or suppose I'm in the, I choose the second row, then you can choose between 11 and 10. So 
your first column is always better. So you'll choose the first column. And it's the same for me, so I'll choose the first row. So we will choose 2-2. Two, two. I, I used to play this game with people. Uh, even with women who work for the Swedish Development Agency and who are really nice and soft-hearted, but <laughs> they always ended up in this corner and then they would be sort of feel ashamed of themselves and, and like, oh dear, you know. Um, because, you know, it's, I put this big pile of money on the table and they wouldn't get it. So, there would seem to be that kind of a problem with, with common pool resources. Eleanor was very careful. There, there's, there, like, this abbreviation here, CPR, it can be used for common pool resources or for common property resource management. She was very, got very upset if you mix them up. So one is like just an aspect of nature. Some resources are just, you know, like common pool resources because, because <coughs> for instance, their yield is too low to, to like, so you can't divide it up into private property. Um, or the solution then is common property resource management. So if, you, if we together are going to manage the fishery, there would seem to be this sort of uh, prisoner's dilemma. So how are you going to, each of us, going to make sure we don't take too much irrigation water, too many fishes, whatever, because, and, and it's symbolized by this, by this herdsman who thinks, well, um, in fact, I remember an article I, I, I saw where there's, this journalist asks this guy in, in, like in Mali, why do you have like, so many goats when you know that half the goats are going to die because you know, the next time it will be dry, there won't be, everybody has too many goats, half the goats die. And he says, yeah, says the guy, I, I need about 10 goats for my family, so I have 20 because I know half the goats are going to die. And then he looks at the journalist and says, what would you do in my place? So, so this, this herdsman is actually smarter than the journalist because, um, I mean, he's right. Your existence and your family depends on it. You know that when it's a dry season, half the goats are going to die. You need 10. How many goats do you try to get? Well, at least 20 because uh, you need that to survive. It's not a game, it's your life. Uh, so, so, you, so everybody gets too many goats and that's the reason why they die. But it's, it's, it's not like easy to get out of this game when it's real stakes. When the stakes are high enough, we all play this strategy, basically. And one of the ways out of this is um, by changing the payoffs and uh, by doing uh, repeated games. And there was a fascinating story, and in fact, um, Christian um, Lindgren was, was, uh, had an, an early article on this. This is a guy from the Department of Physical Research Theory. So, um, there was some famous tournament amongst game theorists some 20, 30 years ago and where all, any game theorist who wanted to could kind of play in a game and there was, there was, it was a prisoner's dilemma which you had to play a hundred times and you had to send in your strategy. And a lot of famous game theorists send in the uh, strategy number one because that was considered, I mean, this game had already been analyzed and everybody knew that was, is the best strategy. But that strategy did not win because this game was more complicated and it was iterated, so you, you're playing a hundred times. And the strategy which won the first tournament uh, was called uh, tit for tat. And I guess those of us who are from English-speaking 
countries maybe know that. This is, this is like children's language. You know, if you, um, if you step on my sandcastle, I'll step on your sandcastle, and, or, you know, <laughs> and then we go on playing. That's what tit for tat means. An eye for an eye, basically, also. And so um, that is, you, you pay this, you start off with this strategy here, and you continue with that strategy until the other guy cheats on you, and then you retaliate once, and then you go back and play the, 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 the nice collaborative strategy again. And that strategy won in the first tournament, but then of course, then people started changing their strategies, and there were more tournaments, and then more complicated. And uh, Christian wrote an article about this, where the strategies were like genetic codes, and they were, or species, and they were competing for survival. Uh, uh, it's a very nice article. I think also, it's a fantastic, I think I remember this rightly, he never got it published. And it's the, um, like the most cited but non-published article, <laughs> or one of the most, you know, that there is, because it, it was a working paper somewhere, so it, it's very cited and very famous, but actually did not get published. Right, there's, um, you can also change the game and you can say, well, if you're in a village, you don't just get hay and milk and fish and stuff, you also gain and lose reputation. And that brings us back to the, like to a village setting. If you take more water, groundwater, than you have the right to, for instance, maybe you lose reputation. Uh, reputation can be vital because you, you need your neighbors to help you and when you get ill and when you get in trouble and stuff. So, <coughs> The second payoff shows here, for instance, that if there is a, a tax of two on cheating, that's kind of a symbol, but uh, then, then the game changes and is no longer a prisoner's dilemma.